uh, I I uh, do have maybe a little bit of uh, of uh, something to share about open source, mostly because when I joined WSO2, I had no clue really what open source was about. So I can at least share you with you what I've learned over the over the last nine years, and um, and hopefully that will uh, that will be uh, useful. Um, I when I met Sanjeeva, we were working uh, in the W3C standards organization, working on open standards around XML, XSLT, turned into SOAP, WSDL, a lot of the uh, web services standards. Uh, and I I worked there until uh, uh, 2006 when I joined WSO2, and um, I really uh, you would imagine, especially back in those days, my, Microsoft's changed a lot, but back in those days they really did not have. Uh, much of an understanding or an appreciation or a dependence on open source. The main thing I knew is whatever you do, never look at any open source code because somebody might sue you and say you've copied something over and the entire uh, Windows platform will be uh, sucked into the GPL and, and, uh, and our business model will be destroyed. That's about all I knew about uh, uh, open source back then. Uh, so I really had no clue also how you could possibly make money by giving away software for free uh, at that time. And I just thought that it was a, a, a very small bit of the business model and a small uh, change in the way the industry worked, but not anything fundamental. And I was really wrong. And uh, I've learned a ton uh, being part of WSO2 and watching it evolve and watching the industry evolve, even watching Microsoft evolve uh, to use a, a lot more open source and support more open source in their operations. And I think uh, what I'd like to, to share with you is uh, my belief that open source has had a very profound uh, change on the industry as a whole, on how our customers uh, are, are building software, they're acquiring software, and even how WSO2 itself uh, has changed as a result of open source in pretty fundamental uh, ways. And, you know, I'm sure all of you know the basis, basics of open source. I don't need to, uh, to repeat those. But uh, this is what I thought open source was when I joined Microsoft. And all these, I believe, are true. Um, it's, it's a very successful way to develop software. Um, when you have an open source community, you need to be able to govern the project uh, without ever meeting face to face. It can be massively distributed uh, among con contributors. It can be geographically distributed and you can still get uh, uh, good work done. So a very effective uh, engineering model. Um, of course, there's an entire ecosystem of components you can build on to speed your evolution uh, in the form of other open source components. Uh, there is a natural, uh, when you have a large constituency and a lot of, of, uh, of different requirements on a technology, it naturally becomes uh, a very uh, extensible and, re and reusable and very flexible. Um, I think uh, th those are, are what I really understood open source to be when I, when I first came to WSO2. I, I also found very quickly that it slashes the feedback cycle. You know, when you have a bunch of committers on an open source project, they're all equals essentially. There aren't the, you know, the, the lead uh, uh, programmers and the designers, and then there's junior programmers who do the dirty work, and then there's the testing people. Everybody is responsible for the entire uh, uh, product. And uh, it me means a very fast, uh, a very flat organization and a very fast feedback cycle. If something's not working, you learn it very quickly and it's your responsibility to make sure the code you contribute is, is solid and performant and, and uh, fits the, the need better. Of course, uh, when everything is open, there's no need there's an encouragement to release regularly because it's really frustrating to see a, a code that you want there but not have a release that you can you can easily pick up and use and with a proprietary license it's easier to hide uh, behind years of of secrecy and then have a big a big uh, release every few years so a faster release cycle which is also very good uh, today and then you know things like security we it's kind of common knowledge that if you open something up more people look at it it's uh, it has a m greater potential to to be secure so these are kind of ones I think we all know this is really what I thought open source was about I thought great we will develop our software as open source but the rest of the business is going to be just the same as any other software business and I don't think that it's uh, that we've seen over the last 10 years that that could be possible I mean the entire industry has transformed as a result of open source. So if it's just a better way to build product, that would not have happened. So there's clearly a lot more going on 
with open source than just the engineering process itself. So, th and this is really what I've learned over the last uh, 10 years. And, you know, first of all, it's what is what has open source done to the uh, value that customers get from their software investments? And uh, one of the first things is it's easy to adopt. Every, every time there's a little tiny barrier in, in getting uh, software, getting it working, getting it approved, making, making something work, it's, it's just a roadblock. And if we can eliminate all of those roadblocks, then, then we're going to be more successful getting the software into the situations where it can do the most good. So again, permissionless. You don't need uh, the permission. Uh, you don't need my permission as an author of open source to use it. You have a license that gives you permission to use that for any pur purpose you want, not just for trials or demos, but for uh, any purpose at all. And we use the uh, Apache license, which is you know, very well recognized in the industry as, as uh, free for you to use for whatever purpose that, that you want. So uh, because you can get it immediately from the time you see the download link to the time you click on it and get the software, there's no process involved. You don't have to go to your legal department and ask whether it's okay. You don't have to go to your finance department and open an invoice uh, or talk to a salesperson. You, you get it. You can very quickly uh, start to use the product and see if it works and prototype See if it works, fail fast. If it doesn't work, uh, iterate on it and evolve a, a prototype or a project that you're working on. So very fast uh, uh, cycle. It's fully transparent. You can literally go and look at every, every line of source code in there. If you really have that interest in finding out how, uh, what the product does, how it works, where the performance bottlenecks are, you have all the information you need to do that. You may not have the capability to analyze the code to find out uh, uh, where the performance bottlenecks are, but maybe you have an automated tool you can run on and see if there are buffer overflows or whatever uh, within it. It's fully transparent. Um, there's uh, having the standard uh, license terms is is really uh, great. You don't have to say, well, I'm using this license, but uh, I've never seen it before. Our legal department hasn't seen it before. They have to look at it. OSI as a as a group has kind of categorized the the popular um, uh, open source licenses, so you have a lot of information about what the the characteristics of a license are. It makes it very easy for you to get a blanket approval to look at Apache license code or other open source license code in your organization. And another thing, once I started working on contracts, in the early days I'd see contracts come in with customers and they wanted to do a code escrow, which is a very common thing for a proprietary. You don't need a code escrow. I mean, the code is up there. Um, you can do your own escrow. You can scrape the, the source code and put in your own, own uh, backup every day if you want. And you also are, uh, we've seen it with many of the other companies and technologies. If a company goes down or community goes down, that code lives on. It will appear in other places. New companies will come up to support it. In the case of MySQL, for instance, different, different flavors and variants uh, go along. So there's stability beyond uh, a, a company history. And that's very important when you're a small company. When we were first starting with WSO2, you know, uh, the, the questions are, well, what if you go out of business? Am I, am I, sunk, you know, I, I've made investment in code, I've put stuff on, and now it's essentially dead code. Well, no, there's, there's still, that code is available, you can maintain it, there will be other customers who are using it, other companies and other uh, contributors that will take that code and, and evolve it if the code has value. And it doesn't disappear along with, with a particular uh, company. So all of these make it, are, are highly valuable in procuring uh, a code for, for users and customers. I think it's, it's natural also to associate uh, open source with a cost-effective solution. Um, uh, this was muddied a little bit by, I think, the tendency uh, to call open source software free software. There's a debate in, in, uh, among the proponents about whether to call it free software or open source software. A free as in freedom rather than free as in no cost. Um, uh, but I think it is true, even, even though uh, all WSO2 products are free, um, we do provide commercial support and services uh, around there. But uh, because there is a free option, which is you use it without support and services, you have a baseline uh, uh, price that you are competing against with yourself. So when WSO2 provides a pricing, we have to do something that is enticing for the level of services we put 
on, uh, that, that's appropriate for the level of services we provide and not just for the, the intellectual property as represented in the code, which is already available for free. And if we charge too much, some other company will come along and offer low-priced uh, uh, services on that. So you, it does put pr uh, pressure on not only our code, but it's been putting immense pressure on the rest of the proprietary software industry to bring their prices down as well. And as customers, I think you all uh, benefit from that. And you know one of the things that uh, that is important is you just consuming software the cost of license is not the cost of of the project there's all kinds of costs of consumption the knowledge that you need to get uh, the the maintenance that you have on it there's uh, many many costs to actually use the software productively um, with it puts it in your control whether you want to put time into your project or money into it you can always uh, we have a saying that you, if you have time, you probably don't have any money. And if you have money, you probably don't have any time. And so you, each of our users makes a, a decision which they have. And there's many, many uh, users of WSO2 who, are, who have no budgets, but they have uh, lots of time and effort. And they're willing to actually learn the product themselves, to put it into, into production themselves, to help maintain it themselves, to, if there is a uh, production problem to take on the risk themselves of the downtime and business impact, the reputational risk. It's fine. If, if, if you have the time to invest in, in the open source, please do. And we're happy when people do that. What we try and do is say, look, all those things have value. And if, it's, uh, if you can put a dollar price on that that's, that's greater than the, uh, uh, the services that we pay, then you know, give us some money and we will give you some of your time back. So you don't have to know how to maintain the code. You don't have to, uh, uh, to have a 24-7 uh, operation that can respond to, uh, to queries and, and deliver patches and, and maintain the product and help you with your architecture and, and uh, develop your project. So you, you get to choose. Do you have time or money? This model help, gives it, it to the customer. And I think that's a, 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 a very important uh, part of, of the whole relationship we have. I think uh, um, this took me a little longer to realize uh, when I joined uh, WSO2 that uh, open source really uh, equalizes the re relationship and normalizes the relationship between the, the producer of the software and the consumer of, of the processor. In a sense, when we develop something and put it in the open source, the license essentially makes it as much yours as ours. Um, if, y if, if the code needs to evolve, then it's your responsibility to help uh, provide the feedback into the code base to help it evolve in that, Hope maybe even contribute to it. You have a, an ownership stake into that code base as, as a member of the user community of that in a way that you don't really have with a, pr uh, with a proprietary uh, licensed uh, product. And so it, um, I think the impact on the sales process we know when you're trying to acquire is is pretty immense we as Sanjeeva mentioned we have an inbound sales process I don't think this is an accident I think this is a direct outcome of of th uh, the openness of of the company and of the uh, technology so um, typically a sales process thrives on information asymmetry the salesperson knows more than you do and can trade off that knowledge in order to sell you something well we've put every line of source code on on uh, the web under an open source license so uh, you know there's there's a huge amount of data already out there uh, for you to use to make a decision we can't you know use sales tricks to entice you to buy the product if it's not going to uh, it's not going to perform well if it's not going to uh, meet your need. You can try it out. You can you stand up a full production system to make sure it works before you, you engage in any commercial uh, transaction, which you can't do uh, with some of the proprietary things. So it really has, has cut out, uh, made the sales process very different. And in fact, we, you know, we, uh, our approach is we give you lots of information. We provide WSO2Con, we provide documentation, we provide blogs, we provide uh, white papers and webinars and uh, training and as much information as we can and let you decide when the product actually fits your needs. You have everything you need to decide whether it fits your need. We're happy to answer questions if that speeds your, your evaluation, but we don't have any secret sauce that, that we can use to, to uh, leverage in that sales process. So our sales process has completely changed change as a result of, of being open about uh, the value of the product.
and really encourage our marketing approach then to be about education. If we give you all the information you need to understand what WSO2 can do for you and decide whether it will have a benefit in your context, then you can come to us and we can work with you to help you deploy that and provide any services that might accelerate you and be cost effective uh, within that project. And uh, again, of course, uh, in that model, uh, we don't have any lock-in. Uh, we, you don't buy a license, we sell uh, support for you in an annual subscription, so we have to work every year. It's not, nothing automatic about our customers coming back to us year after year. Our, the technology has to continue to evolve to meet the new needs and to, to the performance requirements, the environments. A lot of what we're seeing here at the conference is how our analytics solution and uh, the cloud platform and, and our dashboarding solution, a lot of our technology continues to evolve to meet the new needs of, of uh, customers today and to make sure our services continue to have value over the lifetime. And as soon as they don't have value, then we'll probably use, lose you as a customer, and that's the last thing that we want to do. So highly incentivized through, uh, to maintain a very solid relationship. I think uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of our customers uh, really appreciate open source, and even us as a vendor, we appreciate open source because it helps us attract better uh, talent. Uh, people are uh, more interested in working on open source. Uh, a lot of times they've learned it in, in school. They already have a lot of capabilities. Maybe they've done a PhD and built some really great systems. They can take that knowledge and they can continue to use it and not abandon the, the platforms that they've grown to, to love. And it gives, gives uh, each uh, employee and user uh, a lifetime outside that context. You know, they... Um, when you develop, if you're developing a WSO2 product but you move to another company, it doesn't mean that you have lost your committer rights. It doesn't mean you can no longer have access to the code you wrote. It's all open source. You can still have that relationship and you can work uh, uh, with peers in other companies and in the, in the community about that. So it's much a more fulfilling uh, personal relationship. And I think we're finding this is a, a, a very strong attractor for, uh, for, hot, for talent. Oh, I completely missed this when when I joined WSO2. Um, you know, when I I joined, I joined very naively. I thought there were some interesting technical problems uh, that we were going to solve at WSO2 that I could help with, but I didn't realize that that the mission was actually viable, which is to go after uh, the middleware market and become the leading middleware market player. And the answer, the, my question is, well, okay, Oracle, IBM, some of these big guys, they have billions of dollars of marketing budget. How on earth are people even going to find you? How are they going to even notice that you're in the market? So even if you have a better product, that's not going to get you anywhere. But open source itself, I believe, is a brand that is as strong as, as those big brands. You know, so when somebody is doing an evaluation, um, maybe you know, they've, they understand they have a need for an ESB, and they say, okay, Oracle, they're my normal vendor. They have an ESB. IBM, I've used them before. They have an ESB. I better Google and see if there's an open source ESB. And gee, you know the name of our product, WC2 Enterprise Service Bus, and it'll come up under open source. So it's auto, kind of automatically SEO'd to help you find that. So just the brand value of, of being open source, regardless of any of the other values, it has enabled us to actually play on a, on a field that, that is uh, a lot more level with the established players than, than I could have ever imagined when I joined. And, and we see this with a lot of different uh, 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 vendors. I think uh, uh, over, over time when I joined, I thought of, uh, actually I thought of open source as uh, the, um, the uh, open, open office uh, product. And of course I was using Microsoft Office and very, very hard to switch. And I wonder why anybody would, would uh, waste any time with open office when you could just buy a license for a hundred bucks for, uh, for office. Well, there are many parts of the world that, that uh, you can't. Uh, uh, spend a hundred dollars. That's a significant investment for a lot of parts of, uh, of the world. So, okay, so maybe they have to use the cheap clone. But who wants a cheap clone, really? You may be forced to use a cheap clone. But what's happened, I think, because open source development accelerates faster, um, at some point, the open source uh, uh, 
in every category reaches a par with uh, the established, long-developed uh, players and then starts to exceed it because the speed of evolution is faster. And I think if you look at, the, you know, when we talk about big data, almost every time people have said big data, they said Hadoop. I mean, it's literally an open source uh, project has been, become synonymous with the, the leading edge of, of quality. And I think we're seeing that in, and, and we'll see it in many more areas of, of, uh, of software. Um, I think lastly, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what <laughs> open source has meant for WSO2, and maybe you're seeing this in some of your organizations uh, uh, as well. I mean, the, f the first thing that it did in our engineering, engineering prob uh, uh, process is it really converged the technical problem and flattened it very much, which is it's, it's not a bunch of silos and layers of teams that are each responsible for one aspect of the problem. Is the product fit to the customer's needs? Is the, is the product of high quality? Uh, are you supporting the product? All these become integrated. Every person is contributing to a project is responsible for making sure that it, it continues to meet the fit and has an equal say in, in whether it's meeting the, the problem of fit to purpose, whether it, it uh, has a, whether it's quality. I mean, we don't, uh, uh, and, uh, and supporting. So we actually do have our engineers uh, rotate through support so that if there's a bug, <laughs> they experience the pain and they understand what the customers are trying to do. We have them work directly with our customers so they can really see what you guys are doing, bring that back in and use it to help ad adapt the fit. And it's a very flat model. It's very uh, virtuous uh, to to uh, essentially break down the silos, make a very flat engineering team that is responsible for all these things, quality support uh, services and the R&D uh, project. Uh, it really breaks down any siloed thinking between uh, those departments. Um, everybody is responsible for the quality of the product and when, you're, when you're in an open source uh, product. And I think we have taken that to heart and distribute it among other parts of our organizations, not just our engineering process. You know, we are all uh, enabled inside WSO2 to, uh, to comment on the strategy. We have an internal strategy list. Everybody in the company can say, I think this is a, a, a strategy needs adjustment um, or this, uh, this process needs fixing or the way we, we handle uh, some of our uh, internal processes needs to be adjusted. So we've adopted that distributed governance and the openness and the collaboration throughout the entire company, which has made it a very uh, a fun uh, place to work, but also evolving the entire company culture and, and uh, organizational structure and processes uh, at the speed of, of open source as well. I think because of all this, I have you know, some of the statistics from the uh, 2015 Future of Open Source survey that Black Duck Software did. Um, and uh, I think we're seeing that more and more open source is, is starting to become the default for, for organizations. You know, uh, many mo the vast majority of organizations are running open source, of course, uh, and more and more are, are taking it uh, as, as a preference or as, the, as a, uh, a requirement uh, or, and even starting to contribute back to the projects. So you know, what is it that, that maybe you can, you can do or what do we see other people doing? And you know, first of all is, you know, what can you do in your organization to help uh, adopt uh, open source? You know, the first thing is, well, don't preclude it. Don't rule it out. Um, but uh, if you are doing an evaluation on a technology, always look for an open source alternative and it'll help you um, hope, ideally uh, find a better solution, but at least really uh, help your other alternatives measure up, see what they can do. A lot of our uh, companies we see are at, uh, establishing an active preference for open source, and we're seeing that in a lot of governments as well. It's like if there's an open source solution, then that should be preferred at some level because of the social benefits, the long-term business benefits. So if it's a technically even between a proprietary and open source, take the open source because of these additional non-technical benefits. Um, there are companies that require an open source uh, solution or go into a project and say, we, m we will do this on open source. That's a default before we even get started. And of course, giving back and really de deepening your commitment. And we're seeing more and more companies that are interested in contributing back and engaging in the open source and using that to build, uh, build their capabilities and attract the talent. 
So we're seeing uh, also a lot of, of companies that have a transition strategy, which is, yeah, we have lots of legacy stuff. We can't modernize that all overnight, but new projects must be on open source and start to build a, a mix of open source and our legacy systems and, and let that open source footprint gradually expand over time and bring the benefits of open source to our to our uh, collection. And I, you know, I hope that all of you uh, are, one of the things we enjoy is working with you. So <laughs> work with the vendors and, and, uh, and figure out how, uh, how we can help you at all stages uh, of your project. It can save you uh, time. It actually can save you money uh, in some situations, and it helps us to see what you're doing, to understand what you're doing. The most exciting thing, I think, about WSO2Con is hearing uh, the customers talking about what they're doing with, with WSO2 and how it's helping them. That direct feedback is essential in making sure that our platform continues to evolve to be an exciting platform to work on. So that's it.